the higher you go up in those zones, the more time it takes for the body to recover. What, what's basically happening is at the lower intensity, it's fatty acid oxidation that's going on. You're, you're fueling your activity with the mitochondria mm. through fatty acid oxidation, not lactate, um, which is when you start getting to where you can't access energy fast enough from fatty acids, mm -hmm. your body starts switching to the glycolytic energy pathways where your glycolysis is going on. And basically you're having to access or, or generate energy quickly. Mm -hmm. And so when you do that, your muscles are burning lactate to fuel your exercise primarily. At a certain intensity, excess lactate spilling outside the muscles and that takes longer to recover from. Welcome to the Maximus Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Cam Sapa. As a clinical psychologist, medical school professor, and CEO, I specialize in helping men be better in mind, body, and masculinity. On this podcast, I interview extraordinary men as a clinician would, hearing their come up stories of how they became the men that they are today, and having them share their secrets of actionable advice on how to look, feel, and perform your best. All right, we are back with JT to get a little bit of actionable advice about strength training and particularly body weight strength training, uh, since that is his expertise. In part one, we did making of the man uh, in terms of uh, Jerry's uh, career and personal progression into becoming uh, a personal trainer and fitness influencer, if you don't mind my using the term. Uh, but I love to spend the next part of this segment um, you know, educating our followers and our community um, about principles of strength training um, and particularly the type of work that you do. So why don't we just start out and almost like treat it like a master class for, for strength training in terms of uh, what are the principles of strength training that every guy should know in terms of building lean muscle mass, which is what, you know, a lot of guys are, are striving for. Okay, so the most important thing to understand and implement will be what's called the granddaddy principle of, of training. And it would just be the concept of progressive overload. Mm. And it's really important, not just in terms of, of strength training, but really in life in general. And what it comes from, if you think back to evolutionary biology is um, we evolved and we change based on stressors mm -hmm. being applied to us over millennia, right? And so we make these adaptations and it works the same way within a single lifetime or within a day, a week, a month, you apply stress to an organism, the organism adapts to the stress. Mm -hmm. And so the reason it's really important to understand that fundamentally is that I see a lot of times on social media, like, okay, I'm going to do a hundred pushups a day, mm -hmm. right? For however long. And that's totally whatever kind of thing gets you motivated to get moving. I'm, I'm supportive. It's great. I, I don't care. Do whatever, you know, as long as it, you, if you go from sedentary to lightly active, that's actually where this, where the studies show that the biggest increases in health mm -hmm. come from just getting yourself lightly active Yeah, from sedentary. Like we, we did not evolve to be sedentary. Right. Our, your body will literally fall apart over time. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, whatever it takes to get you lightly active. Once you're doing that, your body is going to adapt to the stressor you apply to it. If it's hundred pushups a day, mm -hmm. if it's running three miles, whatever it is, you're going to adapt to it. And once that adaptation takes place, then the strength increases that come from that hundred pushups that they're never going to increase there. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. The hypertrophy, the muscle growth, it's, it's done. Nothing you do is well, I guess if you take pharmaceuticals, but outside of that, Nothing you do is going to net you any more benefit from that hundred pushups. Mm -hmm. Although that physical activity is still has health benefits. So from a general health standpoint, if all you ever did for the rest of your life was a hundred pushups and run three miles, mm -hmm. you could be healthy. I'm not mm -hmm. disputing, like you shouldn't not engage in physical activity just because you're not overloading in that session. Mm -hmm. Right. So you should always there's always a benefit in going and doing something physical mm -hmm. from a health standpoint. But to your point of building muscle or building strength or getting faster or whatever, the only way for that to happen 
is to systematically increase the stress on the body. Mm. So the body then responds to that stress by getting bigger, faster, stronger, or more oxygen efficient. And then, you know, if you're an endurance athlete or whatever. Right. Um, so the reason I mentioned that's the most important thing to understand is you could, and I would actually argue that lots of different programs can get you a similar result. If you just apply those programs consistently, just consistency, mm -hmm. Consistency is king. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's, it's consistency and then consistency of applying progressive overload. Mm -hmm. And to give you an example, at a certain point, this probably won't, this will probably stop working efficiently, but if you did the hundred pushups a day mm -hmm. and after a month you went up to 110 a day and then 120 and 130, sure. you're going to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. Right. At some rate, whatever. I mean, that, that maybe it's not as fast as if you did something else different, but if you don't know anything about training and all, you know, is I have to push myself to do more than I did before. Mm -hmm. You're going to get results, right? Yeah. The people that I find that tend to not really see results are people that are like, and I'll ask them sometimes they're like, Oh, I do three sets of 10 on this. And then three sets of 10 on that, which is, which is not necessarily wrong, mm -hmm. but I ask, okay, when you do the three sets of 10, when you get to the 10th rep, is it really hard? Mm. And they're like, no, I could probably do more. I'm like, okay, then you're mostly wasting your time mm -hmm. because the stimulus from that thing that you're doing is not adequate to get your body to a point cl close to fatigue. Mm -hmm. So there's no adaptation taking place. So you're doing that exercise, which is healthy, but you're not doing that exercise to make gains or to make progress. Yeah. Right. And so from a, so, so that's the underlying principle you want to make sure you understand is you have to progressively overload mm -hmm. and that overload can come from doing more reps. So you put more volume or it can come from more weight or a harder, harder variation of the exercise. So if you slap another 10 pounds on your bench, mm -hmm. you're progressively overloading, right? right? If you do another two reps, you're also progressively overloading. It can, it can come from volume. It can come from intensity. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's other, other ways, but, but those are the two primary ways that you're going to progressively overload. So just keep in mind with your training, as long as you're either adding more reps or adding more weight, mm -hmm. then that's, that's the foundation to making progress. Yep. Um, that's such an important principle. Um, a, a question on this for, uh, you know, some of our audience may be kind of more in the intermediate to advanced, uh, mm -hmm. kind of, uh, you know, weight lifters and, and a common thing that a lot of, uh, you know, guys that I see, um, run into is they kind of hit a plateau at some point, right? So let's say if they're, if they're lifting weights, they're kind of hitting two hundreds in their bench, three hundreds in their squat, four hundreds in deadlifts, and they can't really just seem to add any more weight at that point. Or conversely, let's say if you're doing body weight pull-ups or chin-ups, I think m most guys somewhere between 20 and 30, they kind of just max out in terms of their ability to do that many in a set. How, how do you do sort of progressive overload when maybe, I, I don't know if there is a physiological limit, or at least it appears to be uh, some, some just limit of strength or endurance. So um, when you look at the total body of research, uh, you have your strength, you have hypertrophy, you have endurance, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily endurance, like running 10 miles or whatever. You could do calisthenics or even lift for the purposes of building endurance, like very high rep. Mm -hmm. type training. And those three things, if you imagine a triangle, mm -hmm. as you prioritize any one of those, you kind of, the triangle kind of skews in shape mm. so that it's not a, uh, you know, perfect triangle with matching angles. Mm -hmm. And if you want to optimize for two of those, so let's say you're the type of person that says, okay, I want to be strong and jacked. Like mm -hmm. I want to only big and strong. Do you want to be strong before big or big more than strong? Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is that if you, your primary goal is hypertrophy, right. but you also want to build some strength, you're going to, endurance is going to be the least important. It doesn't mean you don't care about it, but you, you've got to figure out how you want to optimize. Mm -hmm. And the more you want to optimize for hypertrophy, the more that your total volume is going to matter because volume is consistently shown to be a driver of hypertrophy. Great point more so than strength. Mm -hmm. Um, and where, where guys kind of take, go the wrong way with this though, is everybody has what's referred to as their max recoverable volume. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So, if, so I'm, I'm talking in this instance, I'm mostly talking about hypertrophy. You want to build muscle mass. Yep. Then if you do more bench presses per week. So if you were, if you were doing two days of chest and three sets of bench each time, well, if you up that to four in all most studies, it's going to show a better hypertrophic response to that higher volume. The problem is if you go, okay, I'm going to add more bench, but I also want bigger shoulders and I want a bigger back and I want bigger legs. Okay. You, you go get, get to where you're doing so much volume that you can't adequately recover from that volume. So a lot of guys think, oh, I'm going to go do this much higher volume program. I should grow better. Yeah. And maybe they see some gains initially, but then it plateaus or they, they start to even lose yeah. or go backwards. That can be a sign that you're exceeding your recovery ability. Yeah. And recovery ability varies widely from person to person mm. um, based on genetics, but also how much stress are you under? How well do you eat? Are you in a calorie deficit? Are you in energy surplus? Right. How well are you, you sleeping? Know, yeah. Did sleep, um, professional stress. If you're a CEO and you're under a mountain of stress, you should probably reduce your total volume of exercise. Mm. Still do it, but right. you know, and you, you could dig into analyzing HRV data mm -hmm. and some different stuff to try to help you figure out if you're overtraining. Yeah. But that's kind of the, there's that triangle and volume is most closely tied to hypertrophy. Mm. You can stimulate hypertrophy on low volume, high intensity work for sure. I mean, and that's valid. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing to remember when you look at studies on resistance training, they are taking averages. If you ever look at like the map, and look at all these little plots on, on, in a study, they say, okay, this subject here, this subject is here. Then there's a tighter grouping of subjects than this guy over here. So you'll find people that experience the most hypertrophy on low volume, high intensity. Mm -hmm. But what, what it is, is they say 67%, for example, of people who experienced the most hypertrophy were in this volume group. Mm -hmm. So when I'm saying, volume is important for hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. I, I have done low volume, single set to failure and gotten great results. Yeah. And so you don't necessarily have to go pile on all this volume to build muscle. Right. But within that triangle on average, the more bodybuilding is what you're trying to do. The more that pushing your volume up, as long as it's within your recovery ability, mm -hmm. that's something that you probably want to try. Yeah. Is there, if you're is there anything in addition to, um, uh, you know, if you're not measuring HRV or you're kind of noticing maybe plateaus in terms of your ability to, to do more, to notice that you're overtraining. Cause one of the things I've heard, and this is obviously kind of a debate in the fitness community is like, some people are like, be very careful of overtraining. Some people are like, ah, most people are not doing enough. And like 90% of people never have to worry about overtraining. Um, so are there, are there signs or symptoms that people should be aware of, um, to be aware of that? Yeah. Your, your sleep quality. Mm. the general okay so when you're overtraining what it really is talking about is your central nervous system's ability to recover from the overall mm -hmm. you know stress demand so if you think about going through a time of just intense stress in your life whatever it happened to be sometimes you can't fall asleep at night and i don't mean because you're on your phone reading articles yeah, or whatever, yeah. but like you're trying to fall asleep and you can't you're waking up in the middle of the night foggy brained you know you're scatterbrained you can't recall things easily Mm -hmm. generally fatigued throughout the day, lower energy levels than normal. Um, those types of things will be, can, can be signs that your central nervous system is not recovering from the mm -hmm. total load of, of just life. And your training is a part of that. Um, the other thing would be if you're, you're not adding, if you're not adding intensity. And when we say intensity, a lot of times people think of the average person thinks of intensity and they think of trying really hard mm -hmm. and in strength training, when they talk intensity, what they're generally referring to is weight on the bar yep. or how hard that individual exercise is. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're no longer able to increase the intensity of the exercise. So again, I don't mean going really fast or whatever, you know, like high intensity interval training, but when we're talking intensity, if, if you can't, if you're doing pushups, if you, if you're stuck at, I don't know, 20 reps, on push-ups, and you're not able to get that any higher. Or if you say, okay, well, let me go to a harder variant. I'm going to try segueing into like archer push-ups or one-arm push-ups. Mm -hmm. um, 
And if you're not able to make progress in that harder variant, as you do it week after week. So basically if you've plateaued in your training, Mm. that's a pretty good sign that you are exceeding your max recoverable volume or your overall stress levels are too high. And you either need to, you know, take a, take a light week, take a week off, Mm -hmm. you know, sleep more, eat better. There's a lot, there's a lot of different facets that Mm -hmm. you can look at. And when you mentioned HRV, the thing that is kind of cool with HRV is it just helps give you a metric that you can look at and kind of tie to some of these things. Right. But yeah, general fatigue and not progressing in your workouts, provided that you're mentally trying, like, you know, if you're putting the effort in or not, but if you're busting your ass and you're lifting less and less, mm-hmm. that tells you, you need to take some time off yeah. or you're in too steep of a calorie deficit. You're mm-hmm. under too much stress. And so then you got to try to manage your stress load. So that's, so that's the best way I would say. And it's kind of like what you mentioned, a guy gets to a point where he just plateaued. Mm-hmm. That could be a sign that you're, you're doing too much. Yeah. You need to back off. Yeah. Um, that's a great point. And I think people, in fact, underappreciate the effect of stress or cortisol, which is catabolic, you know, um, right. and it in fact counteracts the effects of testosterone. And so Uh, you really do. I think every great athlete actually, you know, spends a lot of time, you know, managing stress as part of their overall recovery, because it really does influence your capacity to do, um, you know, both physiologically, the intensity that you're talking about, I think psychologically as well, too, if you're, if you're like really stressed from work or family or other things, it's kind of hard. Some people obviously use the gym as their outlet, but when you're kind of drained, it is hard and and your, your motivation to kind of push the extra mile, do that extra rep, um, can definitely be affected. So I think there's some great principles that you, uh, you know, mentioned so far, you talked about the importance of progressive overload as the granddaddy kind of principle. Um, you know, you, you, um, uh, secondarily kind of, uh, you know, talked about volume, uh, as consistently coming out in the research literature as the biggest predictor of hypertrophy. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about time under tension. Cause I think this is a principle that's underappreciated. I've heard you talk about this, but people are always thinking about, yeah, number of sets and reps. They're not thinking as much about time under tension. Why is that an important principle? So if you think about time under tension, this is just talking about the amount of time that your muscles are under tension from whatever you're doing. It doesn't have to be an external barbell. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's one of the things that initially, especially because I'm not a small dude, you know? Yeah. And I did build muscle for some years working out prior to making the switch to doing all um, progressive calisthenics. But I got to a lean 172, which I started out when I got the Marine Cross 155. Mm-hmm. Um, then I got fat. And then I, I, you know, thank God didn't stay fat. <laughs> um, but I, so from 155 to like 172, 155, 160, somewhere right in there. So I gained about 12 pounds lean mm-hmm. muscle just from lifting. And now I sit around 181 mm-hmm. at a similar body fat level to what I was when I was 172 over the last five years via progressive calisthenics or body weight strength training. So initially people are like, well, you can't really build. I mean, you know, calisthenics are good. They get your heart rate up. They're good for fat loss, but you can't build muscle mass, like real muscle mass, you know, real muscle mass Mm -hmm. with body weight to which I say, well, I mean, we could go look at some male gymnasts because they're all jacked, you know, like super jacked. And my daughter's 15 and she's been a gymnast since she was four. Mm -hmm. And most gyms across the state of California have no weights. Yeah. At all. So it's not like they're over there deadlifting in the corner when nobody's looking or whatever. Totally. People, people um, fail to appreciate that. In fact, Carl Lewis is one of the, the greatest Olympic uh, medalists of all time. One of the fastest guys in the world, I, I believe for the majority of his career, never touched a weight at all. And he was very jacked in addition to being very fast. Yeah. And, and the thing I would tell people is in, in gymnastics, it, they're the strongest athletes among the strongest athletes in the world, pound for pound. Mm-hmm. And they by far have the strongest shoulders in the world. The the advanced gymnastic strength elements, like a planche, if you've ever seen a planche, Mm -hmm. things like that, your shoulders have to be so strong because of the torque that's applied to that joint. It Mm -hmm. it, by far the strongest shoulders. But if you take a gymnast, they're not going to be able to deadlift like a, a football player. Sure. They just don't practice that particular skill. And at the collegiate level and things now, I wouldn't be surprised if they do. Right. I mean, as a coach, you say, okay, we don't need to bicep curl when we're a gymnast. We don't need overhead press. We don't need that stuff. We, but 
doing a good hip hinge with some weight would benefit these athletes. So I wouldn't be surprised if high level gymnasts now are deadlifting and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the one thing I would say that if you enjoy body weight strength training and it appeals to you, um, if you can add a weighted hip hinge of some type in, mm -hmm. that's the one exercise that I don't think you, you can still train all the same muscles that a deadlift trains, mm -hmm. uh, but you can't, from a performance standpoint, from being able to improve your, your, your jump and like explosive power and stuff like that, a deadlift is still hugely beneficial. So I would just throw that out there that, while I think you can get phenomenal results without mm -hmm. a barbell, right? If sometimes people ask me, okay, I'm, I'm having fun with learning one arm pushups and this is cool. I, it's, it's good to have a change from lifting, Yeah. but I have weights. What should I still add in? Right. And then hundred percent, it's a, a weighted hip hinge. Awesome. Um, yeah. I'd but, love to hear your argument about sort of body weight strength training. Right. Um, so obviously one key argument is during this quarantine era, um, gyms are not easily accessible for, for many people, uh, and having the freedom to be able to do it anytime, anywhere. But I, I certainly, you know, work with a lot of CEOs and they're traveling all the time. And so even, you know, their home gym, when they're traveling, they, it's hard to get consistent access to a gym. Um, so, you know, those are some of the issues, you know, uh, reasons that come top of mind for why people should get into body weight training. But I, I'd love to hear kind of your, your pitch to our followers about, uh, why should people look into body weight strength training either as a replacement for going to the gym or maybe even as a complement to it? Yeah, I think, um, one of the biggest differences is that most people, when they, they, they structure a lifting routine and they go to the gym, a lot of times people spend, in my opinion, way too much time doing like tricep extensions and bicep curls and lateral raises. And there's not nothing wrong with those exercises. There's a time and a place for lots of different tools in a toolbox. So, and it's the same thing with diet and you, you follow me on Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, what? I never really put down anybody's methods or whatever, because I think again, the, the toolbox can be robust and you can use things for different purposes. But if you do a chin up, mm -hmm. your biceps are lifting your entire body over a bar. Mm -hmm. You don't need to do curls. You're just wasting your time. Mm -hmm. Now the catch there is if somebody gets into bodybuilding and they're keeping in mind that max recoverable volume, mm -hmm. when you're repping your chin-ups, you're also stimulating your back, which is a good thing. Right. But if a guy's already got his 20 sets per week for back and he's like, okay, my back training is good, mm. but I want a little extra bicep volume. Okay. Mm -hmm. Throw some, you know, th throw some curls in there or whatever, if you want. Mm -hmm. But the thing with body weight strength training is that you, there's not really very much, if at all, any isolation mm -hmm. and people will look at me and they're like, dude, your arms are jacked, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I've seen them in person. I can attest to that. <laughs> and so I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, I do extensive different, all kinds of different pulling rope pull-ups and all kinds of stuff like that. Mm. All the while my biceps are pulling 180 pounds mm -hmm. over the bar, up the rope, whatever. So I think the biggest benefit is nearly everything you do in, in a, body weight strength training. Well, again, think about like gymnasts, almost everything you do is multi-joint full body. I would challenge guys. If you've never tried a one-arm pushup, mm -hmm. just try a one-arm pushup. Yeah. It's hard, dude. It's brutally hard. I mean, you, you know, you learn it's a new, it's a new strength skill. And so you got to practice it. So even if you're a strong bench press guy, mm -hmm. you're most likely going to try a one-arm pushup and really struggle. Mm -hmm. And it's not because you lack the pressing strength. Mm -hmm you lack the coordination between the muscles, the core, the glutes, everything that has, you know, that's, it's a plank mm -hmm. and a one-arm pushup, you're in a plank, but there's a lot of torque. Your abs have to stabilize. So what I would tell people is if you go, Hey, I got 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. I want to get a brutally efficient workout in 30 minutes. You can do a body weight strength session in 30 minutes. Mm. That's going to very efficiently work your body from head to toe. Right. Because almost everything you're doing is, multi-joint compounds. It's incorporating a lot of different muscles, but you're not bicep curling. You're not right, right. doing tricep extensions yet. You're still working all those things. Mm -hmm. um, so from an efficiency standpoint, I think it, it, it's really good. Yeah. And then of course, not needing equipment to your point, right. you know, so I tell people all the time, if you love lifting, that's awesome. I mean, a lot of people prefer a barbell. There's, mm -hmm. it's an excellent way to train. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But one day when you go on vacation to Hawaii for a week mm -hmm. and you don't have your gym with you. Right. So last time we went to Hawaii, which is a couple of years ago, I wake up in the morning before I'm a super early morning guy and my wife and daughter are not. Mm 
Mm. So I just slip out of the hotel room and I'm right in front of the Pacific yep. doing a workout on the, you know, throw a yoga mat down in the sand yep. and I don't need a gym, mm. which kind of a funny story. So we were in Hawaii and I walked down to the gym, the hotel gym. Cause the, you know, I'm all, let me check out the fitness facility. So it was in Oahu and it's the Hilton Hawaiian village. Okay. So I walk in the gym and the gym is overlooking the city, not the ocean. Mm -hmm. So there's this row of cardio equipment. So like treadmills and all that. Mm -hmm. And there's all these people running and using the elliptical, staring out the window at buildings. <laughs> right. And I'm like, dude, we're, we're literally at one of the most beautiful beaches on the entire planet, right, right. like in the world. And we're in here breathing recircled air conditioned air running on treadmill. This is these, what the hell? You know? yeah, yeah. So I just walked back out and then I went and ran like three miles down the beach. Mm -hmm. There's like whales and dolphins. I'm like, what in the hell are people staring at buildings? Yeah. Um, so the reason it's, it's cool to be able to, even if you just go to my YouTube channel, I've got some full workouts. You can just follow along, whatever. You don't have to prefer that style of training. Yeah. But to be able to know that wherever you go, just like COVID hit and all of a sudden your gym's closed down. Oh crap. I can't go to the gym. Well, you know what? I can still apply progressive, progressive overload mm -hmm. to body weight training. Don't look at it as high rep endurance training. Look at it as strength training. Right. Okay. I can still get this done. I can still at a very worst case scenario, I can still maintain my physique, mm -hmm. but the reality is you're probably going to get stronger in some areas you were weaker on. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a good resource for people to, even if they don't practice it actively to know where it's at so that if a pandemic hits, mm -hmm. if the gym closes down, whatever, or as a dad with kids, I will tell you, if you've never had kids, yeah. when your wife has a kid, you're not going to the gym five days a week. Dude. <laughs> it's tough. Like, yeah. Yeah. It really is hard. And, and even if she's super cool and you do go to the gym five days a week, I can tell you from having a wife and listening to her friends, mm -hmm. they don't want you to go five days a week. Yeah. And they're like complaining about it, you know? Right, right, right. So being able to say, Hey babe, listen, I'm going to go to the gym two days a week so I can get my deadlifts and all. And I'm going to work out at home two days a week so mm -hmm. I can be here next to you and the kids. Yeah. It gives you flexibility. So, That's, so yeah. I think it's valuable for, yeah, I think it's valuable from, from that standpoint of being able to give you flexibility to not always have to go somewhere else to train when time doesn't permit. Right. Yeah. I think the, the versatility and flexibility of it is key. And I ran into that myself, you know, I signed up for a nice gym here in LA, uh, shut down obviously basically immediately when the, the pandemic hit. And fortunately I live, uh, you know, within walking distance to Santa Monica beach where the original muscle beach is actually before it was relocated to Venice. And it's nothing but, you know, pull up bars, dip bars, rings, um, and so uh, every day, basically for my lunch break, right around noon, when it's, uh, pretty close to solar noon and the sunshine, um, you know, is strong, I would go outside, you know, take off my shirt so I can get adequate vitamin D, uh, and do body weight strength training. Um, and that's what, that's one of the actually surprising benefits that I noticed was not only could I get a great, obviously workout in, uh, in terms of hypertrophy, as you were talking about, but I actually just felt so much better being, uh, in the fresh air and the sunshine, uh, as opposed to a gym and in, in, you know, with a rate of vitamin D deficiency, which is almost ubiquitous, uh, nowadays, um, I think it's like 60%. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you're talking about, um, uh, suboptimal levels, it's, it's probably actually like 95 plus percent oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. in terms of, you know, getting people to maybe the 80 to hundred nanogram per deciliter range. Like we talked about with, uh, you know, in the previous podcast with Dave Asprey, um, but, but yeah, it, it it's such a, a very efficient way of getting your vitamin D because that 30 minutes right around solar noon, uh, assuming obviously you're not burning. Um, you know, I, I started to develop kind of a base tan, um, and I'd use my little D minder app on my phone, which would basically tell you how much vitamin D you're getting and making sure that you don't burn. Um, right. so it was great to kill two birds with one stone from a health perspective, you, you know, building your muscle, building your vitamin D. Um, and there's other benefits too, by the way, to sunshine as well. It actually helps reduce blood pressure in a, in a way that's independent of vitamin D. So even if you're taking the supplementation, which is very helpful in, uh, for most people, um, it's very hard to actually get to optimum levels, even with sunshine, uh, even if you live in California. Um, but there's still utility in getting sun, even if you're taking supplemental vitamin D because of uh, all the other benefits as well. And I know that's a big thing, you know, in your neck of the woods too, uh, you know, you get sunshine in Bakersfield and, and. Uh, I'm sure you notice the benefits of that as well. And being able to work out in the, in, in the fresh, uh, fresh air and outdoors. Yeah. It's, it's actually to a point where, so in our house, we have, um, like, a when you first walk in, I guess it's called a great room plan or whatever. So we have this big room that's supposed to be like your formal living and dining. 
And then you go around and we have our kitchen and there's like a family room. And so when we moved into this house, it was right. My son was two months old. And so I told my wife, we had a formal living room furniture and dining room table. We literally never use it. It's just for decoration, you know? And so I told her, I'm like, Hey, there's like 600 square feet. It's like 600 square feet. This is a good size room, you know? And I was like, let me make that a gym and I'll cancel my gym membership Mm -hmm. and not go back. Yeah. Cause I would still go once in a while to the gym, you know, but we had a new baby. And so she was like, yeah, whatever. We don't use it. That's fine. You know? So now I have my, that room is half my kid, my son's play area. It's like all his Legos and his stuff. And the other half of it's like, I got a treadmill and a, and a rack and all that. Mm -hmm. And then I have my rack outside Mm -hmm. and I work out outside as much as possible Mm -hmm. because like you said, subjectively, it just feels better. Mm. Like standing out in the backyard in the sunshine with my feet in the grass. Yeah. I feel more alert. Sometimes I'll be doing work on the computer and it's like you said, you know, noon, one o'clock, I'll, mm. I'll, I'll just feel like, okay, I got to go outside Yeah. and I'll go outside and just standing in the sunshine, mm-hmm. you know, even sometimes I have a hoodie on, it's cold outside mm-hmm. if it's like winter, you know, but just getting sunlight, getting sunshine. Um, there's definitely something about it. And to your point, like you mentioned, it's, it's beyond just vitamin D there's studies that show in the morning. If you wake up and go walk outside and get actual sunshine, mm-hmm. you're more alert, you're awake yeah. versus staying and in, indoors and artificial light. rhythm helps you sleep better too. Right. Yeah. You do, you sleep better. Um, and so for people listening to this, I, I do encourage you if you can work, if you can work out some kind of outdoor training mm-hmm. and, and one of the things I'll mention, um, I see a lot of times strength coaches hating on some endurance work, mm. right? They're like, I see all the time, you should be doing HIIT, you should be lifting and you should be sprinting because you're an explosive animal, wildebeest, whatever. Mm-hmm. You should never run any distance. You should never do low intensity cardio. Right. And just real quick. So the most Jack dudes on the planet are bodybuilders. And granted, they mostly take lots and take drugs. Sure. But if you think professional athletes don't take drugs, no matter the sport. Yeah, like, that's true it's pretty naive, you know? Yeah. Uh, but the thing with bodybuilders is they're not up there doing a bunch of sprints and a ton of HIIT. Right. And the, and the reason I want to talk about this quickly is that again, when you're talking about your max recoverable volume, right? So when you are training with high volume resistance training, mm-hmm. you need to allow adequate recovery from the high volume resistance training. Right. And when you start piling on HIIT, which is not easy for your body to recover from totally that impacts your recovery ability. Yeah. I've talked to at least over the last couple of years, at least a hundred people on Twitter, at least that are like, Hey, I'm, I'm not seeing the gains, but I'm busting my ass. And I'm like, okay, tell me what you're doing. And then they tell me, and I'm like, stop the HIIT. Yep. Don't sprint. Now I'm not against sprinting. Sprinting is great. We evolved. I mean, I try to use common sense. If you look at hunter gatherers, you know, you're familiar with, uh, look at like the, the hunter gatherers from Tanzania and that type of thing. Yeah. Sometimes they're sprinting after. Sure. They got to hunt. <laughs> yeah. Right. But they're also hiking and light jogging 10 miles mm-hmm. while they're out there trying to find their mm-hmm. prey or whatever. So in my mind, doing some very low intensity cardio, Mm-hmm is really beneficial and it's beneficial for multiple reasons, but we evolved to do it. Every hunter gatherer society around the world, th- there's the, man, there's the one ones in South Africa. I, can't, I mean, South America, I can't remember the name, but they have the healthiest arteries in the world. Okay. Um, they're from Bolivia, Okay. but I think they're like eight to 10 miles a day of hiking Yep. right through the jungle. You have all the, the ones in Africa, except for the ones that started farming. They don't walk as much. Right but that's a newer iteration. Um, but we evolved doing, we evolved doing low intensity. I mean, they're not running marathon pace for 10 miles. They're very, very low intensity. So the, the benefit to a strength athlete to doing some low intensity cardio like that is that from a recovery standpoint, mm-hmm. it's cake to recover from that. Right. It's not adding to that total volume mm-hmm. provided you keep the intensity very low. Right. Yeah. And the reason, so the further, right, I mentioned that we talked about getting sunlight. So if you're the kind of guy, you love your deadlifts, your heavy lifting, you've got a gym you like to go to, and you're just not going to go do calisthenics in your backyard a couple days a week. If you just go do a real easy, either a hike 
out in the sunshine, take your shirt off. Or if you go do like a two, three mile, super low intensity run. And I'm talking like low, low intensity jog. Yeah, nice jog. Yeah. If you're, if your chest is burning, your, your intensity is too high. <laughs> if your right. side hurts, your intensity is too high. Really, really low intensity. If you've got dogs, take your dogs on a brisk. Mm -hmm. So, so you can definitely go out and get some sunshine. Even if you don't want to do, you know, calisthenics in the backyard. And no matter what you see people online talking about, you should only be sprinting and doing HIIT. Those are all tools, but all those high intensity tools are harder to recover from. And the more frequently you do those, the more it's going to be lessening how well your strength training is going to work if it pushes you past your max recoverable volume. Yeah. So that's just something to think about because I constantly get people where I'm like too much HIIT. Yeah. Yeah. Too much sprinting. That's, that's a great point. Yeah. You know, and I, I talk about how useful it is to um, do physical activity ac across the range of intensity, right? That you should be doing some yes. low intensity, steady state training, some medium intensity, which is usually what, you know, weightlifting strength training is in uh, the range of depending on how much time you're taking between sets uh, yeah. and, and some occasional high intensity uh, training. But to your point, I think it's different if someone's maybe working out two, three times a week, you can probably throw in a day of sprints, but if you're working out with like a lot of guys, I know they're, they're doing a uh, five days a week of strength training and it's actually at a pretty decent intensity, adding a sixth day of high intensity interval training. Yeah. It's probably going to burn out your central nervous system. And so you may want to tone that down. Um, uh, which I think is a, is, a, is a very useful and maybe even, uh, you know, counterintuitive, uh, at least, uh, against the mainstream Twitter, uh, noise, uh, uh, opinion. But I, I love that you also talk about low intensity steady state. I talk about that a lot. In fact, one of the, one of the biggest, um, detriments of COVID is the amount of walking and physical activity has gone down tremendously because just people aren't commuting. They're not going outside. Um, and there was some interesting associational data as well, showing that the, the highest uh, association between uh, walking and testosterone was somewhere around 12,000 steps a day. It was actually pretty high. Now there is a little bit of a, you know, chicken and the egg issue there that you, maybe if your testosterone is higher, your energy levels are higher and you're walking more. Yeah. It's impossible to tell exactly what it is, but it's still, yeah. But, but, but I think clearly there's, there's much, there's many other research as well in terms of the benefits of, of, uh, low intensity, uh, walking or kind of light jogging. Um, and certainly for sleep, I, I actually, you know, one of the interventions that I use with clients who are having sleep issues, which unfortunately is the norm these days is to increase their, their walking or their low intensity exercise, like to exhaust themselves and be able to fall asleep. Um, I think, uh, it's, it's amazing how, even though people describe kind of a, a mild kind of fatigue throughout the day, it's, it was kind of the zoom fatigue that we're experiencing. Um, yeah. it's not the kind of physical fatigue, um, that people are generally having, which is very useful. You know, one of the things people notice, in fact, when they travel and they walk a lot from being sort of a tourist is naturally their step counts probably hit over eight, 10,000 steps and they sleep so much better because they're exhausted at the end of the day. And that's such a useful lesson for, you know, incorporating into your daily life as well. Yeah. And basically the, like a real quick breakdown of like, like a little bit of the science of why it is this way is you have these different intensity zones mm -hmm. to your exercise and you kind of have zone one, which would be anything above just a, a light walking around your house type doing nothing, you know, very, very lightly active. Then you get into zone two, zone two would be an activity that you can support without having to breathe through your mouth roughly. So like if you were doing a brisk walk, a light hike, a very light jog, you could probably just breathe through your nose and you'd be able to sustain that. Then mm -hmm. you're most likely in zone two. When you have to start mouth breathing, you're probably in zone three. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be your heart rate is going to vary person to person, depending on their overall fitness level. So it's not a specific heart rate. Um, and then your zone four, and that's going to be your, you know, pushing it balls to the wall, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And the higher you go up in those zones, the more time it takes for the body to recover. What, what's basically happening is at the lower intensity, it's fatty acid oxidation that's going on. You're, you're fueling your activity with the mitochondria mm. through fatty acid oxidation, not lactate, um, which is when you start getting to where you can't access energy fast enough from fatty acids, mm -hmm. your body starts switching to the glycolytic energy pathways where your glyc glycolysis is going on. And basically you're having to access or, or generate energy quickly. Mm -hmm. And so when you do that, your muscles are burning lactate to fuel your exercise primarily, but at a certain intensity, excess lactate spilling outside the muscles. 
And that takes longer to recover from. And it's harder to recover from. It's more mm-hmm. CNS stress. That, that's why I think there's some really awesome stuff about CrossFit. Mm-hmm. But what I don't like about CrossFit is, in my opinion, there's just too much balls to the wall yeah. training every day. Yeah. You should not be getting rabbed or throwing up, uh, doing it during any workout. And I used to be a competitive runner. Uh, so I, I think it's very masochistic, uh, at least yeah. some of the ways in which it's done. And, and there's research that was, um, done in tour de France professional, like the top cyclists in the world. And for a long time, coaches had them training in these at the high, primarily in the high intensity zones. Mm-hmm. Right. And what they would find is their performance would plateau and sometimes start to degrade and just similar to the guy going balls to the wall lifting and his volume's too high Mm -hmm. your body just can't recover from that and you're you're not sure why so what they started doing is they started training in zone two Mm. which is counterintuitive because you think okay if i'm a world-class cyclist Mm. why am i practicing in this low intensity zone that's easy for me Mm -hmm. right but what they find is that it's improving mitochondrial health and fatty acid oxidation, which you still use to generate a percentage of the energy, even at higher intensities, even though it's not predominantly fatty acid oxidation. Right. But long story short, they would then go do a, a performance test and they would perform better after shifting some of their training to zone two, instead of all of it being zone three and above. Right. So that's what I would say for, for your person that's primarily a strength athlete you're listening to this and you think man i love i don't like to run i'm not an endurance guy yeah i prefer strength training that's me i prefer strength training Mm -hmm. but i still go run three to three and a half miles like two days a week Mm -hmm. and uh, i've got some dogs i take my dogs and they're they're peeing along the way it's (laughs) it's like jog walk jog walk it's you know my heart rate's like 140 it it's very low intensity so I got to stress that because most people, if they just strap on their running shoes, even if they're a strength guy and they go run, yeah, they're going to run as fast as they can com- somewhat comfortably run for two miles right. and their chest is burning and I'm like, God, I hate running. Yeah. But for most people who are physically active, even if they never run or do any cardio, if you lift, you can probably go do zone two for two or three miles and your chest won't burn. Your side won't hurt. Yeah. So, so, so I just wanted to give kind of a basic why some low intensity cardio is a good idea from a general health standpoint, for sure. It's a good idea. Yeah. But even to a strength athlete, the reason that it's a good idea to incorporate some of it is the intensity of it's low enough. Mm -hmm. It's not going to eat away your muscle mass. It's not going to be catabolic as long as you're not doing too much of it. Yeah. You know, the, the argument you see on Twitter is, well, look at dude, marathon runners look like crap. They're all skinny. Well, marathon runners are not, strength training five days a week, first off. Yeah. Right. And then people go look at sprinters. They're super jack. Yes. But they're deadlifting and they're lifting four days a week. Mm-hmm. They don't look like that just because they sprint. They Absolutely. look like that because they strength train yeah. to be powerful. Right. So if you're a strength train trainee and you do some low intensity, steady state cardio, mm-hmm. it is not going to affect your gains. Right. As long as you're not like marathon training. Yeah. And as evidence of that, bodybuilders since the seventies have been doing mostly low intensity, steady state cardio, right. Getting insanely jacked and shredded. Sure. So, so there's, you know, evidence that that's what they've done forever. Right. And it doesn't sap your gain. So I wouldn't be afraid of getting outside in the sunshine and going on a little jog, just keep the intensity super low. And I don't think there's any need to go for more than an hour total a week, about an hour a week is probably fine. That's such a great recommendation. Um, one of the things that we're particularly interested in, in uh, Maximus is kind of hormone optimization. Um, and mm-hmm. I'd love to hear your sort of, if, if you have any sort of thoughts on, you know, uh, natural ways to, to support sort of healthy testosterone levels, um, uh, whether it's through diet, uh, exercise, uh, or, or any other sort of means that you found helpful. Cause I, you know, uh, you obviously have a very, uh, great phenotypic uh, profile in terms of, you know, yeah, I think a lot of guys would look at you and say, that's the kind of body that I'd like to have, uh, you know, especially as I get, you know, uh, towards older age. So if, if you have any sort of tips or tri- tricks or secrets that you can share, uh, I think people would love to hear it. I'm going to take older age as a compliment. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, we hang out with a lot of Silicon Valley 20 something. So you're definitely not old. I think you're, yeah, you're, no, I'm 41. Probably the, the, the 
probably the average age of our of, of our, our, our community, I would say. Yeah. So it, on, on that front, one thing I would say is you hear commonly from people that, uh, well, as you age, your testosterone levels decline, or as you age, you know, these different things happen, but there's some research and the body of that research is, is growing that it's not normal provided that you live well. Right. So it's, it's us living out of sync with, you mentioned earlier, our circadian biology, mm -hmm. it's modern life, not being in tuned with, you know, optimal living basically. Yep. So things that I really do think are important for optimizing natural testosterone production are going to be trying to maintain a fairly consistent bedtime. Mm -hmm. uh, and then within that getting enough sleep and from, from looking at the data, you hear people say, Oh, you got to get eight hours of sleep, mm -hmm. but there's kind of like a spread. Mm. And as long as you're not on the extreme low end of sleep mm -hmm. or the extreme long end of sleep, like nine hours plus, you may fall somewhere within that maybe seven hours of sleep is what you naturally get. And the way, the way that you test this is just start making sure your environment's conducive to sleep, right? You got, mm -hmm. it's dark. You don't have a bunch of lights. It's not right. loud and make sure your sleep environment's good. And then just don't set an alarm mm -hmm. and start looking at how many, how long did you sleep for? Mm -hmm. And so if you can do this for several days, maybe it takes you, okay, I'm going to do it on my days off. Cause I have to wake up for work. I have an yeah. alarm clock, whatever, but your body knows what it's doing. So if you, if you say, okay, my last 10 days off, I checked and I sleep from 7.2 to 7.4 hours. And then right. I wake up on my own. That's probably the right amount of sleep for you. Right. Absolutely. And for most people, it'll be somewhere between a little over seven to a little over eight hours. That's kind of like normal. Yeah. I talk to people often on Twitter where they're like the, the oh. bedtime as well. I think a lot of people yeah. get used to waking up at a certain time, but if you start dialing it back 15, 30, 45 minutes, and you start noticing that you're waking up earlier because you just need seven, seven and a half hours. That's also a good telltale sign. I think sometimes people are right. cutting their sleep short because they're quite frankly going to bed too late. And then they're like, oh, I just get six hours of sleep. And I was like, I bet if you went to sleep an hour earlier, maybe you'd actually need seven. So that's the second part that I would, I would add to your suggestion. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and, and I, I think looking at modern hunter gatherers, just because they live the most like we evolved to live, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's not exactly the same as a thousand years ago or whatever, but it's the closest. Um, they have fires, right? I mean, they have sure. light at night, but it's not led and all that. Mm -hmm. But from what I've been able to gather, most of them, they do stay up. And they, somewhere around 10, 10 30, they're generally going to bed. So it's not like you got to try to go sleep at eight or nine o'clock. I mean, mm -hmm. but I think in our society, it's like 11 30 midnight's probably the average. Yeah. And so to your point, moving that back an hour, and it's probably going to vary person to person, but mm -hmm. I notice subjectively how I feel, but also my HRV data are the best when I'm going to bed around 10, 10 30. Mm -hmm. Like if I can fall asleep in that range. Um, and I sleep about seven and hours and 15 to seven and a half hours. Mm -hmm. But to your point, I used to think, oh, I'm, I'm six and a half to seven. That's my natural. Right. But when I finally just stopped a morning alarm, thanks to COVID and working from home, and, yeah. you know, I was like, okay, no more morning alarms. I'm right, like, right. oh, I really need seven and a half. Totally. I, I always say, in fact, that if you're using a morning alarm, other than just like as a backup to not be late on a consistent basis, you are by definition sleep deprived because you're yeah. literally waking your body up from wanting to sleep more. Right. So I, I definitely think number one, like you mentioned is sleep duration, but also sleep quality mm -hmm. because that's when majority of your, your recovery processes are going on, you know? Right. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind, cause I see this a lot is somebody's dieting. They want to lean out. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you want to lean out, you're going to have to, you know, have an energy deficit over time. Mm -hmm. And anytime you eat an energy deficit, anabolic hormone production goes down mm -hmm. in response to the energy deficit. So what I see a lot is somebody will be dieting and they're exercising and they've been doing this for months, right? Like mm -hmm. losing a significant amount of weight and they're like, Oh, my testosterone came back. It's only 400. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, well, you're dieting, you're, you're under dietary stress, you're exercising and all, all that stuff. So I don't think anybody should take their testosterone levels in a deep energy deficit. Mm -hmm. You're doing a bunch of fasting, you're, yeah. you know, 
that can lower it too. So now right. obviously you don't want to, you don't want, if you're already overweight, you don't want to go, okay, I'm going to eat 3000 calories a day. Cause I want sure. high testosterone, yeah. you know, but when you finally get to where you're eating at maintenance, mm-hmm. if you're eating at maintenance, that's probably a good measure of your true testosterone levels. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I would say making sure you're not in a deep energy deficit. And if you get blood work done when you are, don't panic if your testosterone's low because you're dieting, right. you know, exercise and it can be resistance to exercise. It can be endurance training. Exercise tends to be correlated with higher testosterone production, mm-hmm. but at the very high ends of training, that's actually not the case. Mm. And that's generally because you're overtraining, which is mm. increasing cortisol, which is lowering yeah. testosterone, which you you know alluded to earlier. So yeah, definitely exercise, but make sure you're not overtraining. Um, I think stress management is really important. That, part of that is sleep and not overtraining, but whether it's mindfulness, meditation, um, it can be t- taking a walk out in the sunshine. Sure. So that's the other thing. I think people tend to look at meditation and they recommend meditation, which is, which is great. Mm -hmm. Um, but like mindfulness, deep breathing walks in nature. There are other activities that have been, have shown roughly very, very similar results Mm -hmm. to meditation. So if you're living under a lot of stress, if you're the CEO, that's, you know, burning the midnight Mm -hmm. oil or whatever, um, and you're feeling stressed out some type of mindfulness meditation, like midday, a walk after lunch. I mean, you know, but I think stress management's huge and I'm sure you come across that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and realizing that on average, if you address your lifestyle factors first mm-hmm. and then you get blood work and your testosterone's still low, mm-hmm. then pharmacologically taking care of that, it like low testosterone is an actual problem for men. Sure. So I don't think anybody should feel guilty or bad about going and getting treated. Mm-hmm what by via whatever means, I mean, I'm not a doctor. So I'm going to tell somebody what type of, you know, how they should handle that. But I think that for most people, the first thing you want to do is address the lifestyle factors. Mm -hmm. If you get those things nailed down and you have low T then yeah, you should probably talk to a medical professional and get that taken care of because it's linked to type two diabetes and loss of bone mass, low energy, you know, all all kinds, actually, I think, uh, chronic fatigue and some other stuff as Mm -hmm. well. You, you probably know that better than me, but yeah. No, it's, it's, it's such a good point. And, you know, I think we should always start with lifestyle first. I think most of the clinical guidelines of, uh, you know, different specialties always say that I, I used to do a lot of work in diabetes. And that's the mm-hmm. first thing they always say is like, of course, fix your, fix your diet, fix your exercise, fix all that before we talk about diabetes medications, um, which is, which is fundamental, but you know, some people need extra help. Um, vitamin D, you know, people actually forget it's actually a hormone. Um, oh, yeah. just like testosterone it is. And it's the same thing. It's like, yes, maybe in a environment, where maybe we're farming outside or hunting outside all day, we, we got sufficient vitamin D exposure, but it's very hard with our kind of an indoor lifestyle um, to even be out more than an hour a day, I would say for most people. And anyway, if you live below a certain latitude, which is probably San Francisco, Washington, DC, and Athens, you're almost guaranteed essentially uh, if you live above that to be vitamin D deficient. So um, you should obviously, you know, fill your reserves with, you know, good quality, oily fish food that's high in vitamin D, get sunshine, and then if you want to take it to optimize, op- optimize it to optimal levels, um, then, you know, a supplement makes sense. And I think the same analogy obviously applies to, you know, testosterone as well. Do whatever you can, uh, you know, holistically, uh, as well. And that's one of the things that we do actually at Maximus is we put people into these, uh, uh, groups on discord so that people can improve their diet, their exercise, their sleep, their focus, their intimacy, all these kind of what we call the five foundational health behaviors. Um, and, uh, you know, so that they can get to their natural sort of baseline levels. Um, and then they can obviously, uh, maximize it or t- take it beyond there if, uh, if need be. Um, yeah. I think that, yeah, I think like one of the complaints you hear people talk about with pharmaceutical industry mm-hmm. is they say, well, they just want to cover up symptoms and not actually address root cause. And so I think it's important for us on the flip side of that, not to think that we're just going to take supplements Mm-hmm. and not address the root. It's the same thing, right? Sure. Just make sure you're always doing your best to address the root cause. And my son, he's going to be six in a few months. And my daughter was insanely easy. Mm-hmm. So like she was born and she slept through the night at like two months old. She's just been a really easy kid. So my wife and I had her and I would hear parents kind of like lamenting that their kids are really hard or whatever. 
And in my mind, I'm like, dude, parenting's so easy. I should write a book. This is a tick. Dude, so easy. I can't, what's wrong with these people, you know? Right, right. So then we had my son mm. and it was like the exact opposite. <laughs> he's like milk protein allergy. Every time we had to feed him, he's like acid reflux, oh. cried all the time, mm. breathing issues, like oh, just so many things. Yeah. Like it took him till he was five years old for me to finally sleep through the night. Dude, I'm at five years getting woken up every single night, Jeez, yeah. at least once, if not twice. And so sometimes the reason I mentioned that is sometimes in life, um, external factors simply just don't let you do everything optimally, totally. right? Every, your career has got you working 60 hours a week at this point or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Supplement and do the best you can. And, right. you know, that's all you can do is do the best that you can with what you have, where you are, like, you know, like Teddy Roosevelt said. Yep. So if thing, if your situation is not optimal today, mm -hmm. do the best you can. And hopefully you can slowly improve the situation to work things towards optimal. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I always tell people, don't feel bad about taking a medication. Don't feel bad about HRT. If that's what you've got to do, you know, or, or whatever kind of, yeah, you know, that stuff's viable and for the right person that that's okay. Totally. Yeah. You just don't I want to use that to keep living like shit. <laughs> of course. Yes. Yeah, it's never, it never should be used as a crutch, but, and I appreciate that too, you know, cause of being in psychology and psychiatry, I obviously focus on psychotherapy and, you know, trying to, uh, you know, address root causes as you talked about, try to, you know, through behavioral interventions, you know, uh, address people, uh, mental health issues, um, and optimize their health in terms of building strength and resilience, uh, mentally. Um, but for, yeah, for some people, um, you know, either they need to be on a combination of psychotherapy and medications or the medications temporarily are a great thing to get people in the door. Right. Cause if their depression or anxiety is uh, keeping them from even making any behavioral changes, cause their sleep is all whack. Uh, you know, they, 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 there's anxiety about going and getting treatment. Um, it can be very helpful to actually address the pharmacological side so that they can in fact do the behavioral things. Um, and we find that to be very synergistic, but th that's why to your point, um, and I love the point about the individualization of diet. I think it, that's a great principle for all treatments, right? Everything needs to be, you know, I think there are, there are general guiding principles that do apply to all of us as a human species, but then when you kind of narrow down to it, um, as, as individuals, as people, yeah, uh, preferences, situations, environments, physiology, uh, they all, they all need that extra TLC. Um, so right. on that note, um, uh, uh, where can people find you if they want to learn more about body weight strength training? So the easiest way is, um, body weight strength dot fit. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that's the easiest way is I've got a hundred and something videos on YouTube. Mm. I took the last two months. I haven't put any videos up, um, just with Christmas and family and a bunch of stuff. I got COVID so <laughs> had a bunch of stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of took a little break, but I've got some new content plan that'll be going up. Awesome. But YouTube's I've tried to organize it by playlist to make it as easily navigatable as possible, but it's still not ideal. So what I did with bodyweightstrength.fit is if you go there, when you, when you get to the homepage, it'll say, you know, I'll teach you how to build a strong body using mm -hmm. calisthenics or whatever, like start here, you click start here and it takes you to a breakdown of all the videos organized. So you can go to that page and it, it'll tell you basically, Hey, if you're a beginner, do this. If you're intermediate, do this. Mm -hmm. Here's an upper lower split. It just basically takes all the YouTube content and compiles it to where it's easier to find what you need. Mm -hmm. So I would say go to bodyweightstrength.fit and it'll have everything there. Um, it's all free. I don't charge for anything. So awesome. Yeah, I, I, I found it to be a tremendous resource. In fact, whenever I have clients that are interested in doing it or they're traveling, um, or, you know, they have the setup at home um, or are interested in getting the setup, I always, in fact, refer them to your, your website and your YouTube channel. Uh, and I've, I've gotten a lot of positive, uh, you know, feedback from it. Um, in fact, that's why we, we at Maximus, we're collaborating with you on creating kind of a two page guide for, for folks in terms of doing body weight strength training. Uh, and I'd love to one day per your suggestion, uh, get together and film, uh, you know, uh, a workout together. Uh, I know we've, well, we've done it before, but what I'd love to do in the future. I would no, love sweet. to be able to do that. And I, I think our followers would love to see, uh, yeah, uh, a collab. And I look forward to continuing to collaborate with you. Uh, I, I love your mission. Uh, I, I think you, you know, you, 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 have, you bring such a great practical life experience vibe from, you know, your whole background, which we're, you know, you very generously shared with us. And I, I think you're really a great teacher and educator. Uh, you know, we obviously met through Twitter, uh, and, you know, and really enjoyed, yeah, not only the, the, the education of the content, but I think 
uh, the tone and, and the way that you carry yourself and the positivity in your tweets, where, where Twitter can kind of be a toxic environment, quite frankly, uh, I think really comes across. And I think that's why you built such a good following. And, and so that was my other selfish reason for having you on the podcast is not only do you have such a, a great wealth of health and fitness information that, you know, was great to hear like the physiology of all this stuff, but I, I actually genuinely and sincerely think you're a great positive role model for men. Um, and I think, you know, I'm very privileged to be your friend, very privileged to have you on the podcast. Um, and you know, we want to continue to have great guests like you who, who can be great role models. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, and hope to continue the conversation in the future. Yeah, I definitely appreciate it. And I, I think what you're doing is worthy. And so, you know, kind of like I told you, anyway, I can help contribute. I'm, I'm 100% happy to do so. Thank you so much. Awesome. Uh, so everyone uh, check out JT's great work at bodyweightstrength.fit uh, and his YouTube channels uh, for more.